Mooney thing, uh, which I'm no more sympathetic to the Moonies than I am to the FBI, which has been been on had been on my ass in the 1970s for years. I had two FBI directors convicted on Fourth Amendment violations, and Reagan pardoned them. No, those are the famous M Miller and Felt people, you know, these two directors after J. Edgar Hoover and the uh, whole uh, Watergate business. I mean, they broke into my house and harassed me here in Burlington for, for months. Murray, how do you want to... How do you want to go into this? How do you want to start this? Well, I mean... I mean uh, if we get on a roll, it's going to be fine, but... Well, very briefly, I can give you my background and tell you that I have a, a leftist background of 55 years, that I have been in the communist movement in the 30s, that I had been in the labor movement okay. as an organizer, a foundryman and an auto worker for 15 years of my life, and that right, I'm, not, a, uh, I'm not a right-wing, uh, an unreconstructed right winger. Right There's an alternative. Okay. You on? Yeah, right. I, I got all that. You can continue or do it again, whichever you want. Well, I would really like you to start all over so we can sort of make it a little coherent. I have a whole, okay. just several points that I want to, just let me know when you're shooting for the thing. And I'll okay, do we're it. on. So you can start anytime you want. Well, I'd like, after the recent experience of Russell Means and the attempt, in my view anyway, to break up the meeting that occurred in the Ira Allen Chapel, is it, of UVM, uh, so just about a week or so ago, I'd like, frankly, to present the position that is neither uh, in support of the CIA or in support of the KGB, one that goes beyond the Cold War. I do this as a person who has been in the left in left-wing movement since the 1930s, who has never deserted the left but moved, if anything, more to the left, while much of my generation has, in fact, after a good deal of disappointment with Stalinism in the 1930s, moved more and more to the right. And I'd like to present an alternative voice here, which is neither pro-CIA, nor pro-KGB, nor pro-Sandinista, but which tries to speak for what I think are the highest ideals of socialism in the days of Eugene V. Debs, or of anarchism in the days of Emma Goldman. And I'd like to suggest that there are alternative positions that can be advanced around the whole Nicaragua issue, which I regard right now as a touchstone issue, because I think it challenges the whole mentality of the left. I think it challenges its program for oppressed peoples. I think it challenges its ability to speak to the American people in a voice that is no longer Russian, Bolshevism or, or, or German Marxism or Chinese Maoism, if you like, and that can advance the cause of human rights, particularly those of Indians who are perhaps the least represented people in the world today. And we are not talking of American Indians alone as we mean them in North America. There are 140 million Indians who live in what we call Latin America who have no voice anywhere. As, and Russell Means tried at least to articulate that to the best of his ability. While I didn't agree with everything he had to say, and I certainly do not respect the Moonies, I feel that he is in a very serious situation, the situation being mainly that he went down to Nicaragua some time back, went there with a very open mind and with very supportive attitudes toward the Sandinista regime, came back very embittered, and immediately had all doors on the left shut to him which I happen to know to have been the case. And I've seen that happen to other people before. And I would like to suggest that this is a much more deep-seated problem than the way it has been presented up to now. The way it's been presented up to now, for example, by people like Doreen Kraft and Marvin Fishman, among others, for whom I bear no animosity, has been one of whether or not there were negotiations in 1985, was there an agreement in the summer of this, and was there a disagreement, or was there a falling out, were there mistakes, were there not mistakes. What I'd like to submit is that there are much more deep-seated issues involved in these negotiations. The first thing is that it is possible, I believe, to be a person of the left, or at least I would like to hope that you can be a person of the left, without swallowing a hard-line Marxist-Leninist ideology or even a soft-line Marxist-Leninist ideology and still be opposed to corporate capitalism, still believe in a society in which wealth, 
the wealth of the world is equitably distributed, human rights are respected, and yet not commit oneself to dictatorial policies on the excuse of CIA, CIA attacks or KGB attacks. And that socialism, at its best, in Debs' tradition, or anarchism, can rise beyond the Cold War and be independent, as it once was years ago, of all sides in the world conflict. And this is what is a matter of deep concern. This is what the Nicaragua issue is now beginning to raise. Mary, where, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but where in, in Marxist-Leninist writing or theory do you find the incompatibility with any kind of autonomous group, for instance in Nicaragua or in the Soviet Union or in any socialist mm -hmm. country, having a kind of autonomy and still being part of the country? Well, it depends upon what you mean by autonomy, obviously. I mean, cultural autonomy is celebrated in the Soviet Union, but the peoples themselves do not have any real autonomy. In day-to-day -day in, day, in real political life. They are controlled primarily from major centers, just as Paris controls France. So Moscow controls the rest of the Soviet Union. And to a great extent, and this is what worries me about the United States, Washington is controlling more and more of the country. The nuclear issue is one of the most striking examples that you can't make a move nowadays without the federal government preempting whatever the local population feels about a nuclear power plant. And one of the big issues that the green group that I'm associated with, and no way to be confused with another green group around here, okay, the green group is advancing a petition right now to disengage the federal government from complete control over the siting of nuclear reactors. Now that's what I call greater autonomy. Cultural autonomy everybody likes to give lip service to. Even Hitler gave lip service to cultural autonomy, celebrating the Bavarians over the Prussians and so forth. That is not what we're talking about. Now, where in Marxism do I find this? I find this, first of all, in the Marxist concept and Marx's own writings, and heaven knows that I have studied Marx backward and forward. I find it in Marx's writings, and I don't have to cite them unless you want me to where he makes the claim, beginning in the Communist Manifesto, that capitalism is a historically revolutionary force, that it is creating the preconditions for socialism by industrializing society, by breaking down all local bonds, and by detribalizing, as it were, earlier societies, bringing them into what he calls the mainstream of history, by which he means an industrial society. And he uses the word in the Grundrisse that capitalism is permanently revolutionary. Despite his criticisms of capitalism, he felt that it was historically necessary to go that route. And that route led not only to industrialization, but it led to centralization and it led to the nation state. Now, one can agree with that or disagree with it. There were socialisms that opposed that point of view. People forget or do not know that in Russia, the populists, the famous Narodniki, who later were to form the Social Revolutionary Party, did not believe that Russia had to go through capitalism. They believed that you could start from the peasant village, take what is best in Western industrialism, integrate it into local autonomous regions, or what we would today in the ecology movement call bioregions, and produce a confederal form of association, not a nationalist form. America experimented with that in the 18th century as well. And I would go on to say that that recurred again in Spain during the Civil War, when the anarchists, whether one agrees with them or not, advanced the idea of workers' control of industry, of confederation, of regional control, in a balanced, rounded, and hopefully a felicitous society without the centralization and oppressiveness of the nation state. These were different routes to what we call modernization. And the world was faced with that in Europe going as far back as the 16th century. And it still exists today in a period of transition when we talk about communications revolution, decentralization, and local autonomy. Now, this problem is posed very sharply in Nicaragua. I don't see why there's any reason to deny that people like Borge, the Minister of Interior, or Ortega, are Marxist-Leninists. I mean, I was a Marxist-Leninist for 15 years. There's nothing to be ashamed of that. 
I mean, there's no need to hide that. But the point is, what are the criticisms of that view? And why, for example, did I cease to become one? And why is it that I support the Indian struggle okay. in, in Nicaragua today? Now, but I believe and I submit, and I want to say that this is very important, that I recall this as a communist, you'd promise anything to get support. Lenin promised land, peace, and bread to the peasantry and to the Russian people. The one thing that the Bolsheviks did not provide was land to the peasantry. They gave it, and then they took it back in the form of collectivization. So all these negotiations and all these different images that are created about some new kind of socialism being, in, uh, being built in Nicaragua are, in my opinion, very, very dubious, to say the least. And the idea, basically, that Nicaragua had absolutely no other choice but either to go with the Russians because the Americans were attacking them, or to go with the Americans in order to escape the Russians, in my opinion, is inadequate. Do you know of any example in, in recent history of any kind of popular liberation revolution occurring where um, people were able to come up with a model that didn't? go either into the east west. Yes, I see it right now among the Masurasatna Indians in Nicaragua, who are not trying to go into the east or to the west. That is a popular liberation movement. It has existed among Indians in other portions of Latin America, or so-called Latin America. There are 140 million Indians right now in what we euphemistically call Latin America, and they have no voice, and they carry on a struggle. And their struggle is for local autonomy against all sides in the Cold War. And the left has shut its face to this. It has shut its eyes, it has shut its ears to these struggles. And to some degree, whether well or inadequately, Russell Means tried to present that point of view. And many of my Indian friends are trying to do the same. Well, let me get more specific. And I would like to be more specific about what the Sandinistas could have done. They could have made an appeal and set an example of Indian autonomy that would have stirred the hearts and minds of 140 million people in that region. Well, the, San, the Sandinistas think that's what they're doing. In, Th that's in what they the say the publicly autonomy. they are doing. That's what they say publicly, and they, and they seem committed now, although they certainly didn't five years ago, to establishing some kind of local autonomy on the East Coast. That's because, one, the Masurasatha Indians are giving them the hardest time of their life, far more than anything the Contras are encountering. And they're not doing it with a view toward overthrowing the government, they're doing it with a view toward holding on to their own tribal territories. And they were more than willing to try to negotiate with the Sandinistas, and there are now all kinds of very dubious engagements going on in which tens of thousands of Masurasatha, or at least Mosquito, Suma, and Rama Indians are running away and nobody's going to tell me that this is being done by the Contras. They're running from something. The fact that they're running into Honduras is not their fault. By the way, they don't recognize the national boundaries that the various colonialist and imperialist powers established. And that voice is not being heard. That troubles me profoundly. I submit to you that there is an alternate way to achieve modernization without giving up basic cultural values that are deeply human deeply decentralist, face-to-face -face in their de democratic direction. I am not a proponent of the nation-state as the only route toward modernization. And the Sandinistas are. And the fact that the Sandinistas have been negotiating with them has not been from a position of ideological commitment. It's been quite to the contrary, a position that they've been forced into negotiating and which the Indians, with very good reason, have every cause to believe that they will be reneged upon. And because that has happened repeatedly all through that struggle. I'm not saying the struggle is simple. I'm not trying, trying to say that there were Indians who were working with, the, not, there were no Indians who were working with countries. Of course there are. These are very simple people in many cases. They have not read Marx. They have not read Lenin. They have not read giants like Borges and Ortega. They have just seen what has happened to their lives. And they'll take whatever help they can. But particularly the Masurusata and Brooklyn Rivera have shown the most honorable positions that I have seen. And this has been based not on visits that I have made guided around by Sandinistas, where pictures of Lenin have been removed and put in the closet. And this was told to me, by the way, by people who are supporters of the Sandinista regime and have gone to Nicaragua. 
I'm talking from a knowledge of Indians whom I've respected in America, who I know have been persecuted by the FBI and by the police. I'm talking of people up around Dr. Sosny area, the Mohawk people, and so forth and very close friends of mine who I know to be absolutely independent of the Cold War. I only wish that many people who call themselves leftists were that independent. Why did your, the, the main target of your, your venom seems to be on the left, and, and you si single out Nicaragua as an example of a country that has a terrible relationship with its indigenous peoples, but certainly you could find many other examples of countries that have bad relationships with indigenous peoples. In Absolutely, I'm not denying that, but it's precisely because people who call themselves leftists and take on the legacy of the socialist ideal come out and betray that ideal, that particularly disturbs me. I have fought militantly, as outspokenly as I can, against what's been happening in Guatemala, what's been happening in Chile, what's been happening throughout the military dictatorships subsidized by American corporations and by the CIA. But right now, the Nicaraguan issue is a pinpoint issue because it's bringing all of these problems into focus. Can you In other words, the whole level is different. The Sandinistas, insofar as they would regard themselves as socialists, take on a special responsibility. It would be as very much as though you were to ask me whether or not a priest or a rabbi is to be held more culpable for his or her religious beliefs than the congregation. And I would say that they are far more responsible. And precisely because the Sandinista regime calls itself socialist, that I have to examine what it is doing and whether it's behaving substantially differently from the way in which ordinary people, and more particularly even some of the military, behave in Latin America. That's number one. And secondly, this focus is being forced upon me. And this raises another serious question. There's a whole element of ostracism right now that exists among the left. I am a leftist, and I find that when I try to communicate with brothers and sisters on the left, that there's this whole Nicaraguan issue suddenly comes up between us, no matter what we're talking about. It's like as though if you don't agree with them, you're their enemy. If you are a critical of their position, if you want to correct a position, particularly when you have some hope that it could be corrected because these people do claim to be leftists, you suddenly find a whole iron curtain is what's wrong in front of you. I've had people break off personal relations with me on Nicaragua. I've had friends of mine who I've known for years who have such an emotional commitment to Nicaragua. I mean, to some piece of socialist real estate, as it were, that they have forgotten that socialism is also an ideal, not a piece of real estate. And these battles were fought out just as vigorously in the 1930s, not only around German fascism, which I had every reason in the world to oppose. I mean, there we were really engaged in fights with fascists in the streets in, in, in New York City. What I'm talking about is there were terrible struggles within the left itself, and the Communist Party ostracized every independent leftist. And if you were an independent socialist, and you were a commun if one was an independent socialist and you were a communist whom you wanted to associate, and you as a communist wanted even to marry that independent socialist, you would be kicked out of the party or out of the uncommunist league. I mean, when that kind of atmosphere develops, when people why does ideals develop? why why how do you jump from the ideal of socialism to that kind of paranoia, that kind of limited? Uh, authoritarian behavior, and is it is it is it necessary? Is it no? It isn't necessary, but it's gradually been built in since the Russian Revolution, with a very hard line of Bolshevism. And I'm not trying to use the word Bolshevism as some type of derogatory term. Lenin was a Bolshevik. I was a Bolshevik at one time. A Which certain meant, hardness what, what did it has mean been to you? Built when you were in. a Bolshevik. What did it mean to you? It meant to me that. There were certain people, even if they were socialists, and even if they were democratic socialists, and we were not, I assure you, we were very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. If these people challenged our views, they were objective instruments of, we didn't have an FBI that prominently, they were objective instruments of fascism. This was in New York in the 30s? This was in the, not only in New York in the 30s, it was an international phenomenon. And the Spanish Civil War involved terrific fights, not only between the fascists and the so-called loyalists, but between the communists, the anarchists, and the left-wing socialists. 
who wanted to make a revolution in Spain, not only fight Franco. So go back to when you were in that period. I'm, I'm interested in your world view at the time that you were, as you call yourself, a Bolshevik. Well, I found basically that I was abandoning ethics, that democracy was only a tool, that the end justified the means, and that the defense of the Soviet Union assumed priority over any kind of ideology, any kind of ideals or beliefs, any kind of human associations, and so forth. With the result that, being quite young at that time and not knowing much better, owing to my commitment to the workers' fatherland, as it was called, the socialist fatherland, I abandoned my entire morality for a period of years and found that it was corrupting me. It was destroying me as a human being. I had to accept lies that were patently untrue, you know. I saw the whole Bolshevik Central Committee practically executed by Stalin as being Nazi agents on the most preposterous charges. Lenin's closest friends were slaughtered by Stalin. Hardly any of them survived. Lenin's own widow and Maxim Gorky, the famous Soviet writer or Russian writer, was known to have been poisoned by Stalin because Yagoda, the secret police chief, was brought up on child trial for doing that. And when one knows how to read this kind of literature, one knows that if Yagoda is accused of it, the secret police head who conducted part of the purges, it was Stalin who guided him. That kind of blind loyalty to, in that case, the Soviet Union, or in this case, to Nicaragua, I don't see with the left... Uh, I mean, I think if you if you talk with people that certainly support Nicaragua, uh, I get a sense there is more working with it, hoping it's going to evolve, you know, a day to day. It but then why go into the things. slander, if I may put it, the slander that I have seen going on in Burlington? There has hardly been, from my experience over the past days, before Russell Means began to speak, a poster. I saw this right up at the Peace and Justice Center in which right, written over Russell Means's photo in that poster was CIA agent. I don't believe Russell Means to be a CIA agent. I don't know about the Moonies. I have no love for them. And if I'm asked why Russell Means is obliged to go to the Moonies, I would say in great part because they, the, door, the left has closed its door to him the moment he became critical. And he made that very clear in a speech. He said that when he came back as a Sandinista, critical of the Sandinista regime. He had a business of his own, and doors were being closed to him by the liberals as well as the left. And we had the same situation going on in the 1930s. Now, the point that I really want to get to, it's not a question of what the Sandinistas are going to do from one period to another. The Bolsheviks gave the land to the peasants and let them hold on to the land until 1928. In fact, Bukharin, one of Lenin's closest associates, called upon the peasants to enrich themselves, later to be executed, incidentally, by Stalin, but not because of the slogan. In 1928, Stalin proceeded to collectivize the whole Soviet Union. I don't mean even collectivize. I'm talking about placing virtually the, all the farmlands in the Soviet Union, or Russia, to be more precise, under the control of a centralized regime. And I have seen this happen back and forth all through the history of post-revolutionary Russia. Now, my concern is that I do not, do not believe these kind of negotiations. If the Stalinists have to be pressured into what should be, in fact, a policy that they should welcome, then I wonder what they will do when they do consolidate their power. Now, I don't want to see them overthrown by the CIA. That isn't the point. What I want to see happen in Nicaragua is for a reasonably, what I mean, ethical, and I don't know, maybe I'm being idiotic for being ethical today, and genuinely, independently socialist or libertarian, I mean this in the left-wing sense, a regime developed that will be an inspiration for all of Latin America, and particularly for the Indian population down there, which has nowhere to go and nowhere to look. They can't find it in Cuba. They can't find it in the so-called second world, by which they call, which is usually called the socialist world. They're abandoned. And I would 
out of moral indignation as well as deep-seated political concerns, not sit around and haggle over whether or not they've been given this amount of autonomy or that amount of autonomy. The whole question is, what is the direction that the Sandinistas could have followed and might have had a very great deal of success and impact on all of what we call Latin America and on the Indian communities particularly and on the anti-imperialist struggle? And they did not follow that path. And it's very significant that there's one point of agreement that all the regimes, including the Contadoradan process regimes, have in common with the Sandinistas, and that is to sit on the Indian population and to build nation states and to try to get money, arms, and whatever you can in the typical classical concept of modernizing in a very typical Western way in which both the socialists and capitalists, both the corporations and the Soviet collectives, in quotation marks, agree. I must make that plain, that it's the sense of direction, it's the meandering, it's the foot dragging, that in my opinion tells me more about what's going on in Nicaragua and what's going on generally in the socialist movement. And when I start talking about Stalinization, of the left, which I'm now beginning to see because it's so redolent of what I saw 50 years ago. It is this name-calling, this breaking up of meetings. You know, in the 1930s, when I was in the Young Communist League, we used to break up the meetings of the Socialist Party. We went in, and we'd come in with rocks, and they had these little schools, they were called working men's circle schools, mainly socialists, not communists. And by the way, the socialists, incidentally, were moving more to the left in those days than the communists, who were entering into a people's front policy of accommodation with the Democrats and if any other group that they could find. The socialists were moving increasingly more toward the left, oddly enough, under Norman Thomas. Mm -hmm. And we would break up their meetings. We would heckle them. We wouldn't permit them to hold meetings. We'd break their furniture. We'd crash into their headquarters, and we'd demolish things using, you know what I mean, our credentials as leftists such that the socialists would not call the police, you know, that old stunt. And I'll tell you another thing that I, I, I found extremely disquieting. Not only were there breaking ups of meetings and everything like that, there was the characterization of people as CIA, well in those days you were fascist agents and Nazi agents. And the word that was coined ultimately for the social democrats was social fascists, which led which made it very easy for Hitler to come to power. When the Communist Party intransigently in Germany refused to form a united front with the Social Democrats by declaring that the Social Democrats were a greater enemy than the Nazis. Now, this kind of behavior was reflected in what happened at the uh, Russell Means meeting, and, and that troubled me enormously. Uh, not only did I find posters, CIA agent written over Russell Means' picture, I mean, not only that, but I saw a person whom I know very well, Ronan Murphy, walk up and down the aisle, and this was not at all reported in the press, walk up and down the aisle 15 minutes into the presentation of the film, whatever the film was, and try literally to break up that meeting. It is not that Russell Means attacked him or that he, Russell Means answered his arguments with his fist. That is not at all what happened. What happened was that as soon as that meeting started getting, uh, that, that movie started getting underway, within 15 minutes in the most studied fashion, instead of walking out of the door and even shouting, this man, Ronan Mur Murphy, walked up and down the aisle shouting CIA propaganda to a point where I was outraged knowing the man and shouted, Ronan, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then Russell Means came across the hallway and not by any means in a manner that I personally would approve of, put his fist in the man's face as being rude. But this man was trying to disrupt the meeting. He then went out and the press reported that he was beaten or struck by Russell Means because he objected. This was no objection. This is what we used to do in the 1930s. Disrupt meetings, and disrupt them in a fairly organized way in many cases. And I saw this repeated again by this man and then misrepresented everywhere in the press as though he were 
trying to be argumentative rather than disruptive and rather and trying to, to advance a view rather than break up a meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like the Moonies. I have many reasons for not liking the Moonies. I didn't agree with everything Russell had to say. But the one thing was that I will either be a Democrat in a consistent fashion and let people, whether I agree with them or not, have their damn meeting even if I dislike it. And in this particular case, I liked a great deal of what Russell had to say. What in your own... Or else I am going to become an authoritarian, and that's going to be done to me. How did you cease to be to think in an authoritarian way? What, what was that history about? Where you The purge away? trials, in which I saw everyone I respected in the Russian Bolshevik movement, the men who made the revolution and the women who made the revolution, being put up on charges of the most preposterous nature. Mm -hmm the Spanish Civil War, the total betrayal of that war by the communist movement, and many other things that were going on within the organization itself, such as the prohibition to read certain books. We were not allowed to read certain books. Anyone found carrying a volume of Trotsky's writings was automatically brought up in charges with a view toward expulsion. Anyone who spoke to a Trotskyist or a left socialist was immediately brought up on charges and expelled. And once expelled, you couldn't talk to that person. Such people became non-persons. And, and I don't want to see that mentality appear in the left today around the Nicaraguan issue. What was the climate that allowed that to happen? I mean, preposterous you had a You had a socialist movement which had once been extremely populist in nature, such as the one that existed on, this, on the Eugene V. Debs, develop into a centralized movement following more or less principles of Lenin. They call it democratic centralism, but in practice it was pure centralism, mm -hmm. in which people, whether they agreed with the po policy or not, had to obey that policy without criticism. I don't see in this situation any centralized leftist... There's a tendency in that direction. The, the, the Sandinista regime is essentially a beleaguered regime, and it's beleaguered not only by the CIA and the Contras, they're arresting trade union leaders. They're losing people who supported them in the revolution. Like Pistorto, whom I do, rega do not regard as a CIA agent. Mm -hmm. He'd rather give up the fight than line, with the, uh, line up with either side, which he did. I see Brooklyn Rivera, a highly honorable man, being called essentially a CIA agent. So now everybody's being swept into this whole 1930s mentality. And this troubles me. I'm not saying that the left is all Stalinist. I'm saying there's a tendency now around the heat generated by the Nicaraguan issue to move in that direction. And the next thing is that I will be called a CIA agent. And I'm outraged by that sort of behavior. Let's go back for a second. Let me make a very important point here, if I may, just before we go back. Either socialism is going to be an ethical ideal in which we learn from everyone in the socialist movement, whether it be anarchists, whether it be Marx, and even Lenin, and other people like Proudhon, or it's going to take on a police mentality. And in which case, movements will not be explained because of social forces, which we always said was Marx's great contribution, his theory of historical materialism. They will be explained as conspiracies. Stalin introduced that with the Moscow trials. Everything in opposition to him was a conspiracy that was cooked up in Germany or cooked up in whatever country he seemed to have some animus toward, for good or bad reason. And everyone who spoke in opposition, even from the left, to these interpretations of ideas as conspiracies and social movements as plots by various police agencies, that person became in turn an agent. And as long as we start using that language on the left, we're going to ultimately ourselves turn into agents. And as long as we deal with people as though they're objects, as long as we break up meetings, which is what Ronan Murphy definitely tried to do, then we're going to have our meetings breaking, broken up, and we'll shriek McCarthyism even as we practice it from the left. And that's what I object to, and the Nicaraguan issue is raising that today. It is raising it today, and it really has me deeply upset. That's why I'm so emotional about it. I leave it up to you if you want to ask some other questions. But I also think things should be clarified that were grossly misstated. First of all, the Bellacourt brothers 
are in no sense regarded as representatives of the Indian movement. I've called up several Indian groups throughout the country and outstanding Indian leaders and they've all maligned the Balakots as being people who ought to be viewed with the deepest suspicion. One of them, I was told, is, is a drug peddler. I'm not trying to malign and cast light upon somebody's reputation. The guy's in jail right now for trying to sell uh, LSD in large quantities, in sizable quantities. The other one, Vernon Balakot, I've been told by people I deeply respect, is a man who's vacillated all over the place, has preached the gospel of Indian capitalism like Jesse Jackson once did, and is now moving over to the left when that's convenient, wherever there are some bucks around. There is no AIM in the real sense of the word. Nobody has a right now to call use AIM stationary. This letter by Clyde Bellicourt, if I'm not mistaken, I, whom I believe to be the one in jail right now, was dragged out of the gutter denouncing Russell Means and presented all over the place as though AIM was a movement that really existed right now and as though uh, Russell Means was misrepresenting himself. AIM was a, essentially a prison movement, just like the Battle of Black Panthers, and to, cer to a certain extent the black Muslims. When it started getting out of jail, and started reaching a broader Indian constituency outside penitentiary walls, Russell Means, together with Dennis Banks, were regarded universally by the whole left as being among the founders of that movement. Now, to suddenly renege and rewrite the history of that thing, mm -hmm with a, 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 a letter by a totally discredited person, Clyde Bellacourt, if I'm not mistaken, is outrageous. Everyone cheered Russell Means during the Wounded Knee period. Now, because he dares to question, and in some independent way, impugn a regime to which these people feel committed, suddenly has become not even a member of AIM, nothing to do with founding the AIM, well, what was he during Wounded Knee and what is he today? And why do we get such sharply conflicting stories? Now, this again is a moral issue. It's a question of the health of the left. The left's chances of succeeding today in the United States are about as good as a snowball in hell. The one thing the left can possibly do is maintain its integrity so that one day it can at least offer an alternative to this utterly messy society we live in. And what it's doing is not simply maligning the Russell uh, means. What it's doing is really destroying its own soul. And that's what troubles me profoundly as well. I'm concerned with the moral health of the left. And even if it means that all these people will break with me and accuse me in the most nervy fashion of being a CIA agent or a petty bourgeois when in point of fact, unlike Bernard Sanders, I've worked for years in stale plants in auto, have been in the United Automobile Workers before Walter Ruther ever became its president, was in the rank and file movements of foundry workers during the Second World War, and I'm accused of being, because of some academic background, and because I write, of being middle class, petty bourgeois, and what do I know about the people? This has been thrown at me by very notorious Sandinistas in, in, in Burlington, Vermont. Can you talk a little bit about the Green Party that you're involved in? locally here? Well, I've always been involved in ecology, going back to the 1950s, and there's an attempt to try to form something that will be even an improvement upon what exists in Germany today. Above either side in the Cold War, concerned with the quality of life, concerned with the reharmonization of people and the reharmonization of society with nature. A movement that will try to advance a new politics, genuinely popular, not the kind of parliamentary politics we have today and the kind of party politics we have today. I am one of the people who helped found this in Burlington. I have nothing to do with people who call themselves Greens, whether they call themselves Northern Vermont Greens or anything else, who like have people like Ronan Murphy go in there, I'm not saying that they're responsible for it, but accept people like that and permit them to walk up and down and break up meetings. The people that I'm associated with, the Champlain Valley Greens, oppose those kind of tactics completely. What do the Champlain Valley Greens do? What, what are projects that, that you're involved in? They have been deeply involved in the waterfront. They are now involved in a petition campaign together with the Green Mountain Alliance, a newly formed anti-nuclear group that's working with the Clanshell Alliance that is trying to petition 
for the modification or the alteration of the Atomic Energy Act, which is the only way we're going to get the federal government off our back on atomic energy. Otherwise, every effort is at best theater. Important as it is in mobilizing opinion and in educating people. It's trying to change that Atomic Energy Act. It's involved with the Green Mountain, with the, uh, uh, Green Mountain Alliance in trying to close down the Vernon Reactor now, not three years from now. We're not Johnny come lately on the nuclear issue. None of us ever approved nuclear technology as a certain candidate wandering around did until suddenly it became a nice hot little issue to kick around. And we're not talking about three years from now, we're talking about now. But most importantly, what we're trying to do is create a new politics on a municipal level. And this is a very deep sense in which I feel very closely related to people like Brooklyn Rivera and the Musurasata. We're trying to establish more municipal control in our communities. We're trying to reestablish and rehabilitate the town meetings. We're trying to create and revitalize the neighborhood planning assemblies and turn them into real neighborhood assemblies. We're trying, in other words, to decentralize and put and empower the people, not to guide them, you know what I mean, like a general staff into another centralized form of control with one man rule in Montpelier or one man rule in Burlington. We are deeply concerned not only with economic issues, and we have distinct programs and views on that. We are concerned with feminism. We are concerned with ecological issues. We are concerned with community issues. When you have an, an idea or is, issues that, you're, that you are promoting that are in the vanguard, are way out ahead of popular issues, how do you implement those, or how do you educate, or how would you, for instance, if, if there had been a, some form of revolution and you found yourself in a position of holding ideas that were not uh, universally held, what methods would you use to get the rest of the population moving in that direction? The most important thing for us and I speak only for the Champlain Valley Greens to the extent that I, any one person can. I'm not speaking for any other groups around here that call themselves green. Mm -hmm. And who, uh, you know, send people, I'm not saying they send people, but whose people go in and break up meetings. We would never do a thing like that because we're nonviolent. And we also have a very strong commitment to democracy. But directly in response to your question, our approach would be educational. The most important thing we are trying to help develop is an informed, knowledgeable, and empowered citizenry. And that notion has just gotten out of the hand, head of a good deal of leftist politics today. I'm not getting informed or educated by many people on the left today who are running for public office and essentially replicating the uh, Democratic Party. I might as well go ahead and vote for the Democrats. What would you do in a situation where some outside interest that was opposed to yours was had a lot more money, power, clout, advertising, whatever you call it, to convince people not to pay attention to your message? By working locally, you know, you've heard this thing, think globally and act locally. And the only way we could hope to really succeed against the mass media, which is corporately owned, or committed to one of the prevailing ideologies of our time is to operate and function on a local basis. And that's the only approach we have. And we have no other approach but education. If people do not change their lives, if they need leaders, as Eugene V. Debs himself said, to lead them into heaven, then they'll find leaders to lead them into hell. The main thing is for people to be their own leaders, as it were, to empower themselves. That is our approach. And we are not falling back on any European traditions anymore. I've had enough of German Marxism, Russian Bolshevism, Chinese Maoism. I want to go back to the traditions in the United States of the Committees of Correspondence, the traditions that exist still, however vestigially, in Vermont, of town meetings, of open dialogue, and a genuine face-to-face -face democracy. And I think these issues also come up in the Nicaragua problem. How to proceed and how to act. We are not that much interested in media. Our main interest right now is to talk to our neighbors, to talk to our communities, and to create those forms, those new political forms, that come out of our own revolution, not out of some other revolution. Like committees of correspondence, like town meetings, that will re-empower citizens and create a new politics. And by a politics, I don't mean statecraft. 
When I see many leftists going out right now, running for different positions, they are really engaged in statecraft. Politics in its original Greek meaning meant the polis, control of what was mistranslated as the city-state, in Athens. It meant assemblies of the people. It did not mean political parties with bureaucracies and leaders and charismatic figures coming out and trying to commandeer people and mobilize them. We are not trying to mobilize, we're trying to educate so that people will mobilize themselves. And this is an entirely different vision from the politics I've encountered either on the right, on the left, and frankly even in the center right now. And this is, and it has to be a moral politics. It has to be a politics in which people themselves, who are politically involved, grow as human beings, grow as ethical beings to counteract the total moral breakdown that is going on today. And that's why I'm concerned with going around and sloganeering CIA agent or CIA conspiracy or breaking up meetings. I would break up nobody's meetings. The right of people to convene and do what they want, I don't give a damn who they're subsidized by is an, an, a right that I would defend to the death. Because the moment that right is taken away from any one sector of the population, everyone else will be affected. And I will give you a very striking example of this. In the 1940s, a Trotskyist group, which was opposed to the Second World War on a Leninist idea that both sides were imperialist, was sent to prison for 18 months under an act with the support of the communists who had veered over from an anti-war position because of the Stalin-Hitler pact to a pro-war position because of the, Stal because of the invasion of the Soviet Union in, in June 1941. The communists at that particular point cheered on the Department of Justice in sending these 18 Trotskyist leaders to prison. Now, I'm no Trotskyist anymore. Far from it. But the point is that you know who, under what act the communists were later to be sentenced to jail during the McCarthy period? The very act that they approved of in sending the Trotskyists to jail some ten years earlier. I find it supremely ironical, much as I was opposed to McCarthy at that time, to see the communists going to jail on very legislation that they supported against their left-wing opponents in the Trotskyist movement. In fact, their statement was that the act wasn't strong enough in the Soviet Union, these Trotskyists would have been shot. And this appeared in the Daily Worker around that period, I think it was 1942 or 43. And once we start getting in to denying a Russell Means the right to speak, or even permitting the Moonies to present whatever they want to say, much as I disagree with them, this will ultimately rebound upon us, demoralize us, and that's what I'm concerned with. What I'm concerned with is the moral health of what is called the left today. We've got to get away from this business that this is a CIA conspiracy and that this one is a CIA agent because that individual or that movement disagrees with us. The CIA is clear enough, and even where it's obscure, we'll unearth it. And if the Moonies are taking money from the CIA or being manipulated by the CIA, it should be said. But their meetings should not be broken up. Because once we break up their meetings, we're going to break up your meetings, and our, our meetings are going to be broken up, and finally we'll all be in this moral wreckage that appeared in Germany in 1932 before Hitler came to power. And that's what I don't want to see happen. What, what do people do when, after they empower themselves? Do they I still work in, in the... In the, um, in the within the way the government is set up now, or, or do you have to change government, or what I, What does it mean to be empowered, and, and, and how do you act on it? This is where I think a very important analysis is necessary. I've, I've dealt with it in my forthcoming book, which is coming out, Sierra Club is pu publishing it. Sierra it's Club? Called, yeah. Well, I, I published with Harper and Rowe and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Alfred A. Knopf. That isn't and also I published with left-wing publishers like New Society Publishers and Ramparts. And I, uh, you raise a very important issue. I don't believe that the revolutionary era that you know began with the French Revolution or if you like the English Revolution or the American Revolution uh, exists anymore today. I believe that the old barricade image, you know what I mean, maybe they can do things in the jungles of this area or that area, even there they have to use modern weapons. But I certainly believe in the heartland of corporate capitalism, or for that matter, corporate socialism, 
the old images of the Spanish Civil War are gone forever. And I lived through that era, and I saw it. When it seemed as though you could change things, you know what I mean? What is called seize the power. More and more I've come to the conviction, and this is why I'm more oriented toward the American Revolution than I am toward the Russian Revolution, which was the model of the 20th century for decades, even for three generations. More and more I am convinced that what we have to do is enlarge the democratic institutions we have here in America today. I don't believe that our revolution can be simply thrown into the dustbin and said this is nothing more, as many so-called left historians say, nothing more than a, a coup d'etat by Boston merchants, you know, or Virginia aristocrats. There is in our constitution and in our tradition a very strong democratic component within the republic itself. I believe that there are institutions we can enlarge and expand. And these institutions particularly exist on the municipal level. In the southern New Hampshire right now, unknown, believe it or not, is just the state. To most people in Burlington, a league of cities has been formed, of towns has been formed, in which people who are opposed to the Seabrook nuclear power plant and also opposed to the ecological wreckage that is going on in southern New Hampshire are trying, frankly, to challenge the state government and, frankly, to challenge the federal government. And they're doing that on lines and in directions that are built around structures created in the American Revolution. They've invoked Article 10, if I'm not mistaken, giving the people the right to revolt, which was written into the New Hampshire Constitution and other such constitutions. And they're not doing that from the standpoint of starting an insurrection. What they're saying is that they object it is their constitutional right to oppose a given state law because the state is trying to preempt municipal authority. We are primarily, I would say, most of the Greens that I'm associated with, and again, let me make it very plain that many people call themselves Greens whom I would no way want to, want to associate with politically, and they exist here in Burlington, that we are trying to build around structures, town meetings, popular assemblies, neighborhood associations, and what we would have liked to have seen, a confederation of the towns in Vermont, to offer an alternative to the growing centralization of power, be it in the state government and especially in the federal government. When millions of people can be brought into this, and many Americans can respond to it once it can clean itself of that whole heritage of of that tainted heritage of, a, of a, a nationalistic authoritarian socialism as well as an authoritarian right. Many Americans can relate to this. Whether real or unreal, they believe in it. And sometimes ideas are far more powerful than reality. Judaism and Christianity have shown that over thousands of years. And I believe that there is a politics that can be developed out of our own confederal impulses, out of our own mistrust of centralized government, out of our own belief in the rights of the individual, which have a very progressive potential and can mobilize ultimately, but first have to educate ultimately, millions of people. And the left has abstained from that. It has come out with a bread and butter socialism and property taxes as though that's all we're living around and that's all life is supposed to mean. Important as that may be, but as though that's the only thing that counts. That's and it's talked about centralized government and centralization of organizations and has left it to the right to preempt them in this area. Reagan's popularity is in great part due to the fact that however demagogic he may be, he addresses these issues. Now why should these ideas be taken over by groups that are as fascistic as the uh, Committee Comitatus, whatever the name of it is, the Passe Comitatus, or the right wing? Why can't there be a, an ideal more in consonance with Debs' vision of socialism or Emma Goldman's vision of anarchism that addresses itself to this popular control? What happened in the union movement? It seems that the, the rhetoric in, in the, the union movement has also moved more and more into a kind of self-interest, hold on to your job, get your salary up kind of uh, way of speaking, which has lost a lot of the idealism. that Bureaucratization, but that's why I saw that. 
When I was in the CIO, we didn't have a single paid organizer. I remember being in a plant of 2,000 foundry workers in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, which at that time was an industrial heartland in the United States and as a wasteland, you know. You call that the Rust Belt, you know. But when I was working over there, our president was not a paid official. These were 2,000 workers, easily we could have supported one, who amalgamated together with several other trade unions of a like kind to sustain only one business manager on an ordinary salary, so nobody would want to make a big career out of it. The only time we ever got paid was when we were doing union business, and we went right back to the shop. We had to maintain a living contact. I was the secretary of the local. We had to maintain a living contact with the workers because we were working right beside them. And our main income came not from union funds, but came from our own labor. What has happened in the trade union movement, tragically and pathetically, and I saw this most dramatically in the most militant union since the IWW, the United Automobile Workers of America. I was in the UAW before Ruth that came in, as I point. I saw contracts being signed in which the company would pay the union officials. <laughs> a president of a local became a full-time employee of the union by being paid by the company. The shop steward movement was destroyed, and what you had were traveling grievance men, you know, from the grievance committee, committee men. And they would be on little carts, <laughs> and they were being paid by the company to settle grievances between the union membership and the company, even though they were supposed to be trade union reps. I saw this come to an end very dramatically, I think in 1947 or 48, with the general notice strike, which I was involved in where Walter Ruther called out the workers for th approximately three months. It, was, it seemed like, you know what I mean, a fighter to the death type of strike, and demanded that General Motors open the company books so that the union could see what kind of profit they were making. And then finally sold us out completely, making a deal with General Motors and offering the workers a kind of civil service status with old age pensions and help and this and that for greater productivity. And with that, the union movement reached the turning point in the States. It was no longer engaged in what we used to euphemistically in the 1930s call class war. It was based on what we used to call class collaboration. I find it equally troubling that a socialist mayor in our town will not offer or even consider seriously an attempt to deal with that GE plant, which is making the very weaponry that is being used in a good deal of counterinsurgency war even considering reconversion plans for it. This in the name of being on the side of the workers of the plant. This again shows a certain lack of ethics. I don't know how to live with this. Can, but you have no problem living with the idea of class warfare. That's not a... I have, it's not a question of living with class warfare. The whole question was one of deepening the socialist and what I would call the libertarian socialist, or if you like, the anarchist ideal, to go beyond class warfare into hierarchy itself, because I have as much trouble dealing with the way in which women are treated today. In all parts of the class spectrum, I'm deeply concerned with the way blacks are treated today, and obviously Indians are treated today. And to me, this is not only a class issue, which is not to say that a class issue doesn't exist, I want to push my ideals still further and examine hierarchy and domination, not only classes and exploitation. You know, you don't have to be exploited to be dominated. <laughs> you can talk to many kids around here who are being loved to death and many women who are being placed on pedestals. And they're as dominated as hell. But they're not materially exploited. And this has been one of the great failings of what I feel is the socialist movement today. Mm -hmm. Or more precisely, I hate to put it in very frank terms, a movement that has gone from what was once a very democratic, very libertarian form of socialism in Debs' day to a very authoritarian form of socialism in Gorbachev and in uh, Lenin's day, or for that matter, in Trotsky's day. And I had once been a great admirer of Trotsky. I'm not trying to be unreasonable about these things. I mean, I want more than anyone to see, you know what I mean, a national liberation movement or a people's liberation movement more precisely in Central America. The pain that I feel is the way in which this is involves a denial of a, the rights of a people I so deeply respect, which can't be defined along class lines. A people that regard 
itself as a cultural entity, the Indian people, and who have the least voice of any voice, as Mainz himself so well put it, in the councils of human affairs. And it's tragic that this does not come out, but an attempt was made to, if anything, be disruptive and to nitpick the way I saw Doreen Kraft nitpick and the way I saw Marvin Fish nitpick on whether or not it was this town that was bombed or that town that was bombed or whether or not several towns were involved or whether or not the Kisans for Peace are getting these kind of rights while somehow or other Brooklyn Rivera is being an obstinate son of a gun who doesn't want to compromise with them. Well, I saw that a lot of the opposition to what Russell Means was saying, not so much in his description of the position of the Indian people, but in his call for the CIA to give money to Ms. Surasata with the idea that he could, that they could use the anti-communism in this country and that that was stronger than the anti-Indianism. And that's a tricky... It is a tricky thing, and he put it in a tricky way. But I want to remind some of our socialists about a few facts, okay? Lenin and Trotsky, just before the brest litovsk Treaty, were negotiating with the British and the French for arms in the event that the Germans moved into the Ukraine. So forgive me. During the Spanish Civil War, one of our greatest demands was arms to Republican Spain by the United States. So forgive me. Now, I don't find, you know, why use the word CIA here? Number one, I don't say that I agree with that position. Let me make that plain. I wish it were, if they needed arms that there would be the left would fund those arms and that they didn't have to go to the CIA and that's what they hoped would happen and I don't know that they are even going to the CIA but I can understand however much I disagree with Russell Means' position of desperation because he came here saying that he was when he came back from Nicaragua saying that he was going to come with 100 Indian warriors, they would have a rifle in one hand and a spade in the other. The spade being the symbol that they were prepared to work for the Sandinistas and build a country or fight the Sandinistas if they did not grant the Indians autonomy. And he was put down by everyone. And that is what I find reprehensible, that Russell Means is forced to make a statement that even, however ambiguously, by the way, he was by no means pro-CIA, ambiguously, point out and use that as an example to show that the one thing the CIA has in common with the KGB, the CIA will fund Contras, but not the Masurasata. The KGB will fund the Sandinistas, but not the Masurasata. And what I think he was trying to do more than anything else was not so much raise a demand, but illustrate that the one thing the United States intelligence agencies have in common with the Soviet intelligence agencies is that however much they hate each other, and however much one side or another side may be for or against the Sandinista regime, both of them are against the Masada against the Indians. And that's what I think he was trying to illustrate. And I think he made very damning remarks about Secretary of State Schultz, about the Contra Contradora countries, pointing out that the one thing nobody gives a damn about are 140 million Indians in Latin America. And that's what I think is more illustrative of what he was trying to say than an appeal to actually get $5 million in arms, which is a pure joke anyway. They would do much better if they collected their arms, you know what I mean, in raids on ammunition depots in order to protect their own territory. And let's be frank about it, they're not aimed at, at Managua. The Contras have their arrow pointed at Managua. They're trying to hold on to their own tribal territory. And their position has been overwhelmingly defensive. And if we do not support them, their positions will understandably, even though I disagree with it, become overwhelmingly offensive. We're driving them into the hands of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Contras. They're trying to stay independently of the Contras. And when we go around with words like CIA agent and everything like that and try to break up meetings, then at that particular point, we've given up our integrity and our independence in Cold War. Socialism has become a tool of Cold War diplomacy, and that's what I fear more than anything else. And I think I'm finished. Thank you.